been the depressing projections of global warming, and we've heard about the associated problems of sea level rises and ocean acidification. As scientists, we have seen the direct impacts of many of these things on coral reefs, and there's a decline in the coral cover around the globe, in the Caribbean, and even on the GBR, with our good management in place, we're seeing decreases in coral cover, with coral bleaching becoming an increasingly important threat at removing corals. We have also seen associated changes in the fish communities that we find on coral reefs, with the massive bleaching in 98 underpinning a shift in the kind of fishes that are there from those often that are coral dependent. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see those that are uh, associated with corals to a great extent, and we're replacing these with more generalist communities, things that are feeding on plankton or feeding on detritus and the like. The, the reef itself is changing not only in the corals that are disappearing, but the fishes themselves are changing with it. One of the most depressing things to come through in all of this is increasing reports of these things called phase shifts, where reefs are changing from one state to another, usually from a coral-dominated state, which we find desirable, to a less desirable state, often dominated by macroalgae. So these phase shifts have been reported throughout the world, and the number of reports are increasing as the years go by. This is often associated with something that we term uh, a lack of resilience, as weakened reefs are incapable of dealing with the uh, challenges that they're facing and the changes that are occurring, and they're flipping from uh, one healthy state to another state, and it's often these less desirable or macroalgal dominated states as one of the examples. So this uh, occurrence of phase shifts is becoming more widespread, and it's quite a concern. The key question at this point is, can anything be done? Um, in terms of being a scientist, I used to work in fisheries, and I used to get kind of depressed in terms of the job we did. We used to document declines, and fisheries was often associated with um, identifying what you should do, reporting it to the ministers who then did what they had to do, and things inevitably just went downhill. So I used to do this in England, in, in uh, the fisheries there, but it's happening throughout the world, so there's a constant decline. And as scientists, when we're facing global warming, we're also still coming up with graphs which are progressively going downhill, and it's, a, in general, a, a fairly depressing scene. And one of the things that we must remember is that before global warming came on the horizon, on the agenda, we were already looking at damaged reefs. So it isn't the problem, it's just the latest of many problems that reefs have had to face. So there's an estimate before 1998 with the, the, the global uh, coral bleaching event, 10% of the world's reefs were damaged or destroyed, and up to 56% were regarded as threatened. So that was how well we'd looked after them before global warming started creating all these problems for us. And in terms of the, the phase shifts, these were originally associated with direct human impacts. And it was often overfishing, which was one of the key things that was modifying the way that the reefs worked and making them more susceptible to changes. Now, for me, my goal is not to document this anymore. I, I effectively want to stop doing these kind of uh, descriptive papers, and I want to look for this. In the few remaining years I've got left, it's hopefully not that short, but what I want to do is I want to try and work out how to get reefs to regenerate or to recover. I don't want to, it's a bit like going and seeing a doctor. Do you want to go and see a doctor who can describe in exquisite detail how you're going to die and precisely what's going to happen to you, or one that will try and tell you how he's going to help you or she's going to help you to recover? So as a scientist, what I want to do is find solutions rather than document depressing declines. So, at, at heart, I suppose I'm, I'm an optimist, and the, the guy I'd quote with this would be Winston Churchill, as he said, it does not seem too much use being anything else. We're not going to find solutions by being pessimistic. Optimism, as far as I can see, is the only approach to this. So, what are we going to do? The goal is to try and understand how to get those reefs from the bad condition back into a good condition. The opportunity for this arose when Terry Hughes was conducting a large-scale experiment on the Barrier Reef to try and simulate the effects of overfishing, one of the things that reduces resilience. So the way this was done, 
Large cages were put out, each cage about five by five meters square. They were like small tennis courts in a way, and what they did is they simulated overfishing. It excluded all of the big fish. It created a little environment inside those cages, a bit like you find in the Philippines today. So lots of big fish missing. The result was highly predictable. There was a phase shift. The reef inside the cages where the fish were excluded flipped to macroalgae, and you had an experimentally demonstrated phase shift in, in front of your eyes. The message for the corals was quite clear. This was done after the 98 bleaching. In the cages where the algae grew, the corals didn't recover. In the places outside of the cages where the cage controls were, the corals did recover. So the, the result for the, the corals was quite dramatic and very, very clear. But my question is all about regeneration and recovery. Will those reefs recover once you take the cages away? Now, I knew the answer because I'd been working on parrotfishes for 25 years. And I know that they're capable of removing algae, but they're gentle fishers. They swim around the reef. They, they munch on the little algae. But I knew that given the chance they'd turn into natural-born weed killers. I knew they had it in them. And it was just a, an opportunity for me to demonstrate it that was needed. And this was an ideal opportunity. So finally, I'll be able to put parrotfishers on the map. They're going to be the heroes. They'll save the day. And I'll be the person that reports it. So... Not that I'm seeking the glory. Um, so what we did is we waited until the final day. The cages were there. We had the mesh around the outside. Last thing at night, we removed the mesh. There was three meter high sargassum inside these cages. The cameras were set up. We got into the boat. We left it. The following day, we turned the cameras on before the sun rose. So we'd get everything from dawn till dusk and we'd see what happened. Now, in this particular location, it's wonderful. The Barrier Reef has got some of the highest biodiversity of any reefs in the world. It's near to the biodiversity hotspot. In that particular location, we have 43 species of herbivores waiting to leap onto the algae, and parrotfish will lead the charge. They were going to be in the front, and all the others would be nibbling around the outside. So we turned the cameras on, and, and lo and behold, it happened. What took three years to grow took three weeks to disappear completely, and it had dropped down by half within five days. So these huge stands of algae did disappear. The reefs were regenerating. They were recovering in front of my cameras. And, of course, the parrotfishers were going to do the job. 43 species waiting to jump on the algae, and two did. One of them was a parrotfish, but it was a perfunctory little bit of a nibble around the outsides, and that was it. So they didn't do it. They, my, my little heroes let me down. So who did do it? The answer was a batfish. It came in out of the gloom. There were several of them, and they did most of the feeding. And what was really kind of striking, and in some ways a bit shocking for us, is we didn't know this was a herbivore. We did herbivore censuses. We didn't even count them because we knew damn well they don't eat algae. And what was really striking is that when we swam to these cages, we didn't see them there either. You can see it on the tape. There's a tape running, a batfish feeding. We hop in the water to change the uh, batteries on the camera. The batfish swims away. We go and change the thing. And then when we've got out of the water, the batfish comes back again. It's a bit like the cartoons. You know when you've got the, the cows that are eating grass as you're walking past, and when you walk around the corner, they stand up and start talking. So what's happening when you're on the reef and when you see it is actually quite different from when you're not there. There's a whole other world going on. So... This was nice. It was a little bit disconcerting that we didn't really know what was going on. So we've since repeated it. I've got a, an excellent group of students at James Cook who've been uh, doing this with me. We've repeated this in other locations, in other places. And the answer, again, is it's other fish. When we do this in other places, it's a rabbit fish that comes in and takes it. And again, this is a frightening thing. I've never seen this thing feeding on algae in my life. I've been working for years, you don't see them. These things avoid humans. So our whole perspective of what's happening out there is changed because we use these remote cameras. So the, the end of this, the big question is, so what? I, I started talking about global warming, and then I start talking about fish. Now, if anybody knows me, they'll go, it's Dave again, he's talking about fish. I always do. But it is important. The, the so what question, 
the answer is, if we want to avoid reefs doing these phase shifts, we have to be able to protect the herbivores that are there so that they're going to prevent these shifts happening. What we've now discovered, though, it isn't just what you see, it's what you don't see that's also important. So on the reefs, there are two fundamentally different kinds of herbivore doing fundamentally different things. If you have a reef like this, that's in relatively good condition, all of your algae is small. It's very, very fine stuff, and effectively, it's the equivalent of a nice lawn. So when times are good, and you've got a nice lawn-like system, what equipment do you need to keep your lawn in shape? As per the title of this talk, you need the lawnmowers. So you need a lawnmower to go along and keep trimming it and keep everything down. On the reef, we have lots of those. These are all the lawnmowers of the reef. The ones par excellence are the parrot fishers. And at this particular location we were working, the parrot fishers graze the entire surface of the reef where those cages were every 19 days. So it's like having a lawnmower service. Somebody comes around and every month is nice and clean and trimmed just like the way you'd like it. That's all good when times are good. But when things go wrong and you've been on holiday and you come home and you, you get a back garden that's not what you remember, or something happens on the reef, there's a bleaching event or some other uh, fertilizer spill or something, and you get the macroalgal outbreaks, your lawnmowers are no good. You need a completely different set of tools. In the garden, you'd start pulling out your brush cutter or your chainsaw. You need the same thing on reefs. The thing is, and this is kind of frightening, there's very, very few of them, and we've really only discovered these in the last year and a half. So we have no idea who is going to be able to help us out when times get tough and when things start to change. But what we've kind of discovered from this is that on the reefs, there are fundamentally two different kinds of fish. Those that are good friends in good times and they'll keep the reefs in great condition and those that we desperately need when times get bad. Global warming is going to give us some bad times. We're going to have a rough ride in the future. It is upon us. It is not avoidable. But we now know some of the things that we can do to help reefs recover. So we can do the right thing to protect them, and we can also do the right thing to help them heal if something does go wrong. So for the first time, we understand how reefs heal, to some extent, at least for this phase shift, and also what we can do about it. One of the really difficult things with global warming is you sit there feeling impotent in terms of what can we do, how are we going to actually do something to make a difference? The answer is, in many respects, you can do small things in the near future. So overall, it's going to take us some time to come to terms with the evidence for global warming. It's out there, but despite the fact we've got to plan for the future to reduce CO2, we can and we must do things in the near future, in the present, today, we can protect those fishes that protect our reefs. Thank you.